Hey, everybody. Welcome to podcast number 31 for U.S. History since 1865. History 1493. Today is Friday, December 4th, 2015. So today in class, we're going to wrap up World War II, uh, look at the fall of the Nazis, and we'll look at uh, the beginnings of this thing that we call the Long Peace. Uh, and we'll watch a little short video in class on Monday, and we'll discuss whether or not we think we're still involved uh, in the Long Peace uh, due to uh, recent terrorist attacks and things like that. So here is today's podcast. Well, last time we looked at the Holocaust, and we talked a lot about the numbers, uh, the people involved, and just kind of the staggering amount of um, death and destruction brought on by uh, the Holocaust itself. Um, and as we get into the spring of 1945, uh, Hitler has really thrown everything he has left at the Allies and at the Soviets, and his days are numbered. It's really a race uh, between uh, the British and the Americans and the Soviets over who will take uh, the city of Berlin first. Uh, the Germans had not been very nice as they had invaded Russia. There was a lot of uh, uh, destruction and pillaging and rape and things like that. So the, the Soviets uh, returned the favor in kind as they came back through Germany. And the Soviets actually get to Berlin first in April of 1945. Uh mainly due to house-to-house -house fighting, uh, raping, pillaging, things like that. And there's a very famous uh, photograph, and a lot, like a lot of famous photographs, it's uh, restaged. Uh, but the, the Soviet soldiers uh, hoist the, uh, the Soviet flag on the Reichstag on May 2nd, 1945. And most likely this is a recreation of an event that actually happened. Uh, but the Soviets do claim the city itself. And, of course, Germany will be divided until uh, the end of the 1980s. Uh, Hitler is underground <clears throat> in Berlin in his bunker. And it's getting towards the, the end of April 1945. And he knows that he's very likely to suffer a fate very similar to uh, other dictators, uh, most like Mussolini, and be uh, and his body be um, desecrated by uh, the mob, and he doesn't want that, so he decides to commit suicide, and he orders that his body and the body of his um, newly married wife Ava Brown be uh, burned in a in a pit outside of the bunker. So on April 30th, 1945, <clears throat> Adolf Hitler marries his mistress finally. Uh, and then within 24 hours, they're both dead, uh, both committing suicide in the underground bunker. So most likely uh, they took cyanide. Uh, they checked to make sure their cyanide worked because we remember from World War I that cyanide sometimes is not very effective. Uh, but Hitler gave a cyanide capsule to his beloved dog, uh, Blondie, and it did, in fact, kill his German shepherd, Blondie. Uh, so he knew it worked. So Ava Brown took her, uh, or Ava Hitler, I guess we should call her at this point, uh, took her cyanide uh, and expired, and Hitler bit down on his and shot himself in the head at the same time. And as far as we know, uh, that was the end of Hitler. You know, there have been stories that the, the Soviets got a hold of their skeletons and, <clears throat> and things like this. Uh, but uh, nothing inclusive has ever been shown, uh, even though the Germans or the, the Russians did uh, say within the last couple of decades that they had the remains. It's, it's not been uh, proven. Uh, but by April of 1945, Hitler is dead. 
by a strange turn of fate, uh, Roosevelt was also dead. Uh, he had died about two weeks earlier on April 12th, 1945 at the Little White House in Warm Springs, Georgia, and he suffered a massive uh, cerebral hemorrhage. And Harry Truman, the vice president, uh, took the oath of office and finds out we had a lot of secrets that even he did not know about. So with Hitler dead and the Nazis in ruins, uh, Germany surrenders to the Allies on May 7th, 1945. So May 8th, 1945 was declared VE Day, which is victory in Europe. So what did happen to Roosevelt? So actually, as he, the day of his death, he was getting his uh, official portrait made uh, by the artist uh, Elizabeth Shumatov. Uh, who had been painting his picture at the Little White House. And it was about noon on April 12th, 1945. And it was about time for lunch. And Roosevelt was being actually served lunch. Uh, and he kind of shot up in his wheelchair and said, I have a terrific pain in the back of my head. And then he slumped forward in his chair. And he was carried unconscious uh, into his bedroom. Uh the president's cardiologist, uh, Dr. Howard Bruin, had diagnosed that he'd had a massive, massive stroke, uh, which claims his life uh, within a few hours, and he's dead at 3.35 p.m. that day. Uh, Shumatov never finishes that portrait. Uh, that version of the portrait does hang in the little White House, and that's the one we see here on this uh, slide. Uh, she does paint an entirely different photograph, uh, which is the last official portrait of FDR. Uh, the only difference is in that one he has a blue tie, and in this one uh, he has on a red tie. So he literally died as this portrait uh, was being painted. So he was in very, very ill health. He'd just been elected to his fourth term. Uh, he'd been president for about 13 years, and... Uh, he died. So it's kind of interesting that the, the lives of Roosevelt and Hitler are uh, very, very close. So they're born roughly the same time. Uh, they have similar impacts on their countries, and they die roughly about the same time. Well, what was it that Roosevelt had not told Harry Truman about? Uh, Everybody had known that in the Pacific, the war had been going kind of slow. Japan had been putting up quite a bit of a fight. And it was likely going to be an invasion of the Japanese homeland, which would cost probably hundreds of thousands of American lives. Uh, Japan had secretly talked with the Soviets about peace, uh, but nothing much had come about. Uh, at the Potsdam Conference, uh, in July of 1945, uh, which was uh, to bring things to an end in Europe, uh, the United States told the Japanese um, ministers uh, either surrender or be destroyed, yeah, and they got no response back. So the thing that Truman had just learned about was for the, the previous five years, uh, a lot of exiled German scientists uh, were working on a secret project in Los Alamos, New Mexico. Uh, what had happened was a, a group of German scientists had persuaded uh, the most famous of all German scientists, Albert Einstein, uh, to put his name to a letter that was going to be sent to Roosevelt uh, concerning Germany's development of an atomic bomb. Uh, if we don't do it, and they get there first, there'll be no stopping them. So Congress appropriates $2 billion for this, this secret project. And throughout the course of its development, uh, Germany was the target for this atomic weapon. So there's a lot of fears of the German use of this technology. Um, 
that really got a lot of people behind this. Of course, it was too expensive for the Germans to do, but we didn't know about that. Um, the project was based in New Mexico and at Los Alamos, uh, led by a lot of uh, foreign scientists and some very scientists with very questionable backgrounds, uh, like J. Robert Oppenheimer, who most likely was a member of the Communist Party, or he, he definitely had been accused of this. Uh, but he was the man to lead the team. Uh, the team had, after five years, developed uh, a plan for two different types of weapons, uh, one using plutonium as a fuel and one using uranium. So two plants were built. Uh, the, the plant at Hanford Side in Washington would refine plutonium to weapons-grade material and uranium would be refined at Oak Ridge, Tennessee. So you can't just take, you know, any old uranium out of the ground and make a weapon out of it. It has to be a specific, uh, very high-grade uh, weapons material. That's why it's very hard to build one. So they worked for five years. Uh, by the spring of 1945, they had a working model of the plutonium bomb, uh, the more powerful and the more... Uh, complex of the two. So, July 16th, 1945, this weapon, which we call Trinity, uh, was detonated there in the desert, uh, July 16th, 1945. And it released uh, the equivalent of about 19 kilotons of dynamite, which is a considerable amount from one bomb. So we see there's the, the gadget itself. So we have enough for actually two more weapons. Uh, one plutonium and one uranium bomb, which is a gun-type weapon, which we're sure will work. Uh, August 6, 1945, the uranium little boy bomb was dropped on uh, the military base at Hiroshima. Uh, a target that had not been hit at all during the war. Uh, it, this one blast kills 70,000 people, uh, 60,000 people later. And Japan still does not surrender. So Stalin starts to make uh, aggressive moves towards Manchuria and Korea, uh, but we're still waiting to find out what happens with uh, what happens with Japan. Are they going to surrender? So we've used the little boy bomb. We still have uh, the other bombs. Here's a, a photograph of the blast itself. Uh, it's a slightly smaller blast. It's 15 kilotons. So that's little boy dropped over Hiroshima. With no surrender in place, uh, the U.S. dropped the plutonium bomb, which is called Fat Man, on the naval base at Nagasaki. And it's slightly bigger yield. It's the more fancy plutonium bomb. And the next day, August 10th, uh, Japan proposes a, a, a single condition to their surrender. Uh, Hirohito uh, must be left on as nominal emperor, which means emperor in name only. Uh, to the people of Japan, uh, Hirohito is God. Uh, he has no real power or authority. He's the spiritual leader. Uh, this condition is agreed to. Uh, Hirohito, by the way, lives until 1989. Uh, and September 2nd, 1945, the surrender ceremonies are conducted on the deck of the USS Missouri uh, with Douglas MacArthur signing for uh, the United States. So MacArthur is going to help rebuild Japan, uh, much like Marshall is going to help rebuild uh, Europe. So here's a photo of the, the Fat Man Blast, uh, which is a 21 kiloton, uh, and some photographs and recreations of what the bombs themselves look like. Uh, you can see they're, they're gigantic in size, even the little boy bomb is a, is a very, very large uh, ordinance. Uh, but these two weapons are responsible for killing uh, nearly 200,000 people. 
And they're the only two nuclear weapons ever used in war. The United States suffered about a million casualties in World War II. About a third were due to deaths. So we actually uh, had more deaths in World War II than in the Civil War uh, due to uh, actual fighting. But the Civil War still wins when you throw in disease and things like that. Uh, the Soviet Union uh, lost about 20 million of its citizens in World War II. We pretty much got away untouched on the mainland. Uh, there were a couple of submarine attacks, uh, a couple of incendiary balloon attacks launched by Japan uh, that could have been far worse. Uh, much of the world was in ruins. Uh, Great Britain uh, was nearly destroyed. You know, it was blown into rubble. Uh, as far as the United States was concerned, this was the best fought war in U.S. history. Uh, we had one and a half years to get ready for it, and we had arguably the best leadership ever in American history uh, during World War II. Uh, we had Eisenhower, MacArthur, Marshall, Patton, Nimitz. Uh, you know, it ranks right up there with the, the founding generation, and they may... Uh, even have the advantage over those guys. Uh, we had more men. We had more arms. We had more money. We were the uh, the country that could do this. Uh, and we beat dictators with and left civil liberties intact. You know, think today, two of the strongest economies in the world are Japan and Germany. And that's largely thanks to... Uh, the Marshall Plan, and thanks to the rebuilding of Japan by, um, by MacArthur. So there's MacArthur with his corncob pipe. Well, what happens after the war with these atomic weapons? Well, we have to ask ourselves, well, what else could we do with them? You know, could we use them in naval combat? Uh, in 1946, uh, we conducted a series of tests called Operation Crossroads. Uh, this is the second of... Two shots. Uh, shot Abel detonated the weapon above the water. Shot Baker, this one, uh, was detonated underwater, uh, which, of course, superheated the water and created this gigantic column of steam. And uh, they had set up a, uh, a scuttled fleet of American and, and British and German and Japanese ships and things like that out in the Pacific. And this just absolutely annihilates them. So this is similar to Trinity. It's 21 kilotons. So, so far everything has been a, uh, you know, splitting of the atom type thing. You know, eventually we develop thermonuclear weapons, uh, which is the opposite. It's fusing atoms together uh, and creating these hydrogen or thermonuclear bombs. So here's a photograph of the largest test ever conducted by the United States. This is done on the Bikini Atoll, uh, March 1st, 1954. This is a 15,000-kiloton. So we don't talk in terms of kilotons anymore. This is a 15-megaton uh, yield device. It's the largest uh, U.S. nuclear test in history. Uh, at the time, it was too big to be aircraft deliverable, but uh, it would eventually be scaled down. So this is the biggest we ever did. Of course, the Russians don't do anything small. Uh, and in 1961, they developed uh, what came to be known as Tsar Bomba, the king of the bombs. Uh, it's a hydrogen bomb. So it's a thermonuclear weapon. Uh, it was detonated October 30th, 1961, over uh, the Arctic Circle. Uh, it was aircraft deliverable. It was uh, dropped and slowed by a parachute. And it produced uh, a blast of about 50 megatons. And this had been scaled down. Uh, it could eventually produce, uh, if they'd wanted it to, about a hundred megaton yield, and it was deliverable by aircraft. So 
throughout atmospheric tests, we detonated about 300 weapons in the open atmosphere. Uh, some in the United States on the mainland. We shot things into the stratosphere uh, just to kind of see what would happen. So sometimes we have to count ourselves lucky uh, that we're still around. Of course, weapons got smaller. They got put on the heads of intercontinental ballistic missiles, and the world got to be a scarier place. But something interesting happened. Since World War II, the major world powers have not gone, gone to war with each other. It's the largest era of perpetual peace since the Roman Empire, uh, which makes it very noteworthy. So there is something about, uh, you know, communications and atomic weapons and mutually assured destruction and, and things like that uh, that have kept the major powers from attacking each other since the end of World War II. Uh, the author John Lewis Gaddis calls this the long peace. And we'll watch a little short video in class on Monday over this. Uh, and some of the things he says are the causes of the long peace. Uh, nuclear weapons. You know, there's a mutually assured destruction with nu nuclear weapons. If you attack us, we will attack you and nobody wins. Uh, there's increased surveillance over major countries because of satellites. Uh, and there's an increased openness uh, between countries. You know, why would China most likely not attack the United States? Well, we are a big part of their economy and it would not be in their interest to do that. So there's a lot of communication and openness between powers, and the long peace gets longer every day. Uh, we're less likely to die in a war now uh, than in any time in human history. So we'll talk a little bit about this in class after we watch the video. So we end with a little bit of hope this semester. You know, even though you know there are troubling things in the world, uh, we have to go back to Abraham Lincoln and his uh, first inaugural address uh, where he talks about humanity. And he says, we are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained it, must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic cords of memory will swell when again touched, as surely they will be by the better angel, angels of our nature. So hopefully we do continue to listen to the better angels of our nature. Uh, but as far as we're concerned, that finishes up for this semester. So we won't have an exit quiz for nine, so that'll just be a gimme. Uh, we'll end of the year present for you. Uh, make sure you do the quizzes and the discussions and get everything finished. Uh, we have until this coming Friday uh, to get everything done. And I think I've given you an extra day. So I, think, I believe graduation is Thursday. So make sure you get everything finished. Make sure you get your research project turned into the Dropbox so I can get it graded. It is 20% of your grade. So don't forget that. So it's been a great semester. I've enjoyed having you all here. And... Let's remember to listen to the better angels of our nature.